Hey everyone, we're doing some Valor Ridge. The purpose of the videos today is to talk about the whole weapons of war idiocy. And I'm really going to get into some pretty cool concepts in this video, and we're just going to logically beat them down as always. Let's go ahead and get started. You know, if you are a firearms owner or you're thinking about being one, I'm sure one of the things that you keep hearing from people that don't want the Second Amendment to be in its full capacity, every pun intended, and if you hear people talking about weapons of war, we need to get weapons of war. Obviously, we got like two out of the last three idiotic presidents that have said this. You know, I really don't consider the one in the White House right now our president. So uh, he said it before. You know, Obama said it all the time. You know, all their little minions in the media like to repeat that phrase, weapons of war. You know, our, our vice president of the United States keeps saying, we know we need weapons of war off the street. I, I just like to address some things. If we're going to talk about this, first, then we have to understand something. And if we're going to argue something, I'm not arguing. I'm done debating these people on the Second Amendment. The debate was won in 1791 and even before that. So when we're looking at this stuff, uh, I want to make sure we're, we're going to define some terms. Like first, let's define weapon of war. I, I don't know about you, but I'm a historian. And when I read about wars, I see all kinds of weapons being used there. If you're a Roman legionnaire, you'd be using a gladius and you'd be using a pike. If you were a person that was in medieval times, you'd be using a mace, you'd be using a sword, you'd be using a bow, things like that. Those would be weapons of war. For the vast majority of this country's history, people owned the most modern firearm that you could possibly have on a battlefield. For example, during the American Revolution, there were many, many people out there that owned their own firearms and then carried their own personal firearms into the militia and also into the army. So that's one example of that where people would have the most technologically or the, certainly the most prolific firearms in the world at the time. So you could buy a Revolutionary War musket. You could buy a percussion cap musket. You can buy even a breech loading rifle like a Spencer or a lever action Winchester or a 73 Springfield trapdoor or a 3040 Krag or a 1903 Springfield or a 1917 Enfield field or an M1. You can buy all these things. In fact, government used to sell them on the surplus market to America, to the American people. They used to sell surplus ammo to the American people. Of course, Bill Clinton stopped that. But nonetheless, this is what, is what I'm talking about. This has always been the case and certainly was the intent. And I want to dispel a big myth right now before we even get this train rolling. I want to, to address this very clearly. And let's go ahead and take down the elephant in the room. The Second Amendment was written for war. Weapons of war. That's why the Second Amendment was written. It was written for weapons of war. The Second Amendment is specific. It is absolute necessary for war. And what's the biggest war that humanity has waged? It's always been the war against tyranny and centralized power. That's the war our founders fought against the British. That's the war that we continue to fight today when we see weaponized agencies of government going out there and harassing people. That's the war that we see today when we have government agencies trying to shake down private companies to suppress free speech. That's the war that we face today when we have illegal search and seizures and we have intimidation tactics by various alphabet agencies. That's the war that we fight. It's for that very purpose why the Second Amendment exists. And so since we're defining terms, let me define what the Second Amendment says Exactly. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So let's talk about what well-regulated is. Well-regulated means well-trained, well-run, something in good working order. You can find pamphlets from the 1800s talking about well-regulated clocks. It has nothing to do with commerce. It has nothing to do with government regulation. It has everything to do with how they're run. Are they in good working order? Well-regulated in the parlance of the 18th century meant something that works as it should. So let's take this down phrase by phrase. A well-regulated militia. Well, who's in the militia? According to George Washington, our first president, according to a federal law that was passed in 1792, the militia is all able-bodied males. Of course, nowadays that could also include women because I know a lot of women that are physically capable of doing this stuff and prove it every single week in class. And not just physically capable of it, but marksmanship. They are capable, more than capable marksmen. And no, I'm not changing the pronoun. I don't believe in that crap. That's not the world that I grew up in. Needless to say, well-regulated meant somebody that was well-trained in the use of firearms, that could use it, that knows how the firearm operates, that can hit their target, that can do everything that's associated with it. So, a well-regulated militia, that's the first part of it. Well-regulated militia, I just explained to you out there what that means when we're talking about well-regulated militia and what that entails. 
The next part is being necessary to the security of a free state. So who is supposed to secure our state? Is it the government? Is it police? No, that's supposed to be rank and file individuals just like me and just like you watching this video. But let's take that apart. Being necessary, not optional, not, not, the, not a privilege. When people say it's a bill of rights, not the bill of needs, well, the Second Amendment is needed. Being necessary to the security of a free state. Security. You know, there's this whole thing nowadays, people are obsessed with, I need to feel safe. I have a right to feel safe. I have a right to put the adult whoopee over my head. I have a right to feel safe. No, you don't. That's, all, that's on you. That's an individual decision, whether you feel safe or not. I see a child. They don't feel safe when, they, when they're afraid of the boogeyman. That doesn't mean it's real. That doesn't mean we have to entertain such thoughts. All that simply means is you are responsible for your own happiness, and that's why you have a right to pursue happiness. Whether you pursue it or not is up to you. You also have that choice. But being necessary to the security of a free state. Who secures our state? Who protects it? We do. We do. The American people do. The American people are the protectors of the state. They are protectors of our borders. They're protectors of our way of life. And in fact, they're the safeguarders of the Constitution. The government doesn't safeguard the Constitution. The Constitution was written to prevent the government from overstepping it. The Constitution was written against government, not for it. The Constitution was written for us. And it showed exactly where government could cross. Of course, because we have 90% of people under the age of 30 today that don't even have, that they don't know the difference between the American Constitution and the Russian one. Okay? So that, that's a fact. Like, there's absolute academic studies that have been done on this. Okay? So if they don't know about it, well, that's why we're here to help you teach other people. Being necessary to the security of a free state. Necessary to the security of a free state. Free. Hmm. Does that mean government regulation? Does that mean, oh, nope, you can't have this gun. Nope, can't do that. Nope, can't have this many magazines. Nope, can't have magazines that hold this many rounds. Nope, can't have this type of ammo. Nope, can't have guns that shoot this many rounds a minute. That's not what that means. Being necessary to a free state. A free state means that we pursue our happiness, we pursue liberty, and government's not going to interfere with that. That's what a free state means. And then, of course, the next part. The right. Not the privilege. The right of the people. Of the pe people, people, hmm. Where do we see that again? The right of the people. So the people and the militia in the same amendment are conjoined. They are one and the same. The people and the militia are one and the same. And Tinch Cox said this, another founding father. Who are the militia? Are, is it not ourselves? This is a founding father. This is the guy, one of the people that, that helped birth the country who understood this. The right of the people, the right, not the privilege, you don't need a government per permission slip for this. The right of the people, which is us, not the government. Government's not the people. The right of the people to keep. Keep. Hmm. What does that word mean? What does keep mean? Keep means to own or possess. It's yours. The right of the people to keep, own or possess. The right of the people to keep and bear. Bear. What does bear mean? Bear. Ah, I think I, I read this in the dictionary one time. I read about it somewhere in a book. Bear means to carry upon one's person. So the right of the people to own or possess arms, keep and bear, keep, own or possess arms, and bear, carry upon one person, shall not be infringed. Well, who would infringe it? Would it be another human being? Would it be like your neighbor? Oh, nope, that's a scary looking gun. You can't have that. Is it your neighbor? Or is it somebody in government? Is it some government official that they were concerned with? Did they, did they look at history? Did our founders look at history and realize that governments across the world, especially in Europe, would do this to their people? That they knew that they would, they would, they would make their people surrender their arms? Did they, do you think the Founding Fathers read history? Do you think that they knew what was going on in history? Of course they did. And so they understood that when government, if government's going to take supreme power, they have to disarm the populace. They have to disarm the public. They have to disarm everybody but themselves. For a horrible totalitarian or tyrannical state, as our founders would see it, they understood that in order for something like that to happen, the people had to be disarmed. 
And I find it no coincidence that they found it so important to put as part of our citizenship that they put it in the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States as a part of our contract with government, or compact, if you will. They understood that people needed to have arms, and that if government has a monopoly on force, then it would end up the same way from the country they broke away from. And they understood this, and they realized how important it was for the people to have equal power to what the government has. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It's pretty simple when you break these things down word by word. And it's pretty simple when you understood the men who wrote them. And it's very simple if you understand the context of the times that they wrote these in. They had just fought an eight-year war against the most powerful nation on earth who they thought were tyrannical. What was tyrannical about it? Disarmament, high taxation, big agencies of government, unfettered power at the highest level of parliament and the crown. That's what they understood tyranny to be. They would look at this system today and look at it as absolutely reprehensible and horrific. And they would be very happy that we have our Second Amendment today. The only issue is, will people be willing to use it if we deem them to cross the line? Well, the right to alter abolish. That's another right that we retain according to the Declaration of Independence. Even when, it, when governments are destructive to the Europe natural rights, it's our right, it's our duty to alter or abolish that government. Now around this time, leftists or anti-gun individuals will usually accuse me, well, Reed, you're an originalist, aren't you? You're that, you're that evil originalist. So the Constitution, it's a living, breathing document. It's a living, breathing doc. If that's true, we don't have a Constitution at all. You can just change it at whim. In fact, I think there's a book about that called Animal Farm. I'll put a link in the description box for that. When they just kept changing the writing on the wall in the barn. For those of you that went to school post-1990, it's probably not going to be read by you because your teachers probably looked at it as an instruction manual rather than a warning. But nonetheless, here we are, and I want you to understand something, folks. The founders understood times change, but they also understand people don't. They knew that the context that people would be using this in, they knew tendencies of human beings. They understood that government was always going to try to centralize. They also understood that free speech was protected not only in pamphlet form, not only in public speaking, not only in newspapers, but they knew that technology would bring other things. They were very, most of them, a lot of them were inventors, so they knew very well what technology could do. So to say that the Second Amendment only applies to black powder firearms that are muzzle loading, single shot muskets, would be like, okay, well, free speech only applies to like a chalkboard. Like, it's ridiculous logic. It's, it's infantile intellect that would argue like that. And yeah, you know, Rosie O'Donnell, I'm talking to you. I, I, I really think that if, if guns, if, you know, it's like guns kill people the same way that spoons made you fat. And of course, the last piece of this, if, if, if these people that are against firearms and that people that are against uh, people exercising their constitutional rights, if they're truly against people owning arms, then why are they so like pro-arm everybody else in the world? Like, why are they fine with, like, our tax dollars buying the weapons they don't want us to own to be sent overseas so that other people that they're on their side of their war can fight tyranny? Isn't that, isn't that what you've heard, like, the last almost two years now? We've got to help them. They're, they're fighting against tyranny. They're being invaded. Their, their way of life is being, is being threatened. We need to send them guns. Wait a minute. I just, I, I, thought, I, I thought that wasn't even, like, a problem anymore, right? So I guess tyranny only applies on the other side of the world, but certainly not here. And I'm also being tired of being lectured on gun control by the same government that gave $90 billion in aid to the largest terrorist organization on the planet vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban. You know, like helicopters, or, you know, missiles, belt-fed machine guns, M4s, optics, night vision, Humvees, Black Hawk helicopters, you know, stuff like that. And then it's okay to arm them, but like the American people can't have like an AR-15. No, it's just not logically consistent. Not, like I said, I'm, I'm done debating these people. There's nothing to debate. And I think that you need to stand firm out there. These people are children. People that argue for gun control are children. I'm not trying to convert anybody, and I'm not trying to make any friends along the way. I'm tired of this Melvin Milk Toast people. Well, you know, if you're, just, if, if you're so extreme, then we're not going to bring other people to our side. It's 2023. How long are we going to abide gun control? It's been happening since 1934 at the federal level, and before then at the state level when they try to disarm black people. So I'm tired of this crap. Like, what do you mean patience? No, what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. And if you're one of these people that thinks that you're going to talk people into being firearms owner by being a nice guy, so they're willing to disarm you and mandate that you do everything else. Oh, but if we're just talk to them nice, then all of a sudden they'll see the light. I don't care. I'm done with this stuff. Feelings aside, I don't care about your feels.
I don't care about any of that stuff. And we need to start being a lot more firm. We need to start being a lot more firm on our footing. And we need to start demanding that people understand that it is not within their power to disarm us. It is not in their power to make any more laws. It is not in their power to tell us if, how, and when we can defend ourselves. Those times have to come to an end. Those days are over. And only you can disarm yourself. Only you can give up your firearms. Only you can register your firearms. Only you can be afraid to carry your firearms. Only you can be afraid to actually stand on principle. Only you. They can't take them away from you. They can't come get them unless you let them do that. And I guess that's why the Second Amendment was written after all. If you found the information in the video helpful, follow me on social media. That link is down below. And if you want to learn how to exercise the Second Amendment, historically, and if you want to learn how to exercise your Second Amendment on a proficiency level. Come on out to Valor Ridge and we can help you. This is Reed Hendricks of Valor Ridge reminding you, the lessons that we learn are written on the tombstones of others. We'll see you on the Ridge.